Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm aware that we did the first six verses, but I'm going to read quickly through them for the sake of context, uh, just to remind us, uh, because it helps us bridge uh, into verse 7. Uh, so uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and let's take a moment and ask the Lord to uh, guide us tonight. Lord, we're so grateful that in Jesus Christ, you have revealed yourself to us. You have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and because that's true, the speech is reliable and true. And so tonight, as we look at your word, I pray that you will be present with us through the power of your spirit. Change us according to your will and for your glory. We ask these things for Christ's sake. Uh, amen. amen. Uh, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. By the way, that's how you become a holy brethren. You partake in the calling. The calling of God, the effectual call of God. All those whom God calls surely will come to him. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider uh, the apostle and high priest of our confession, uh, Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus is called the apostle because uh, he speaks for God to man, and he is called the high priest because he speaks for man to God. And so we are to consider him... Uh, uh, the high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, meaning the Father, who appointed him in the same way as Moses was faithful in all his house, meaning God's house. Uh, so what the writer of Hebrews is doing uh, instantly is telling you that there is no distinction between Moses and Jesus in the continuity but, uh, of the people of God. There is only one house. And just as we learned in Romans 9, 10, 11, there's only one tree. Uh, there's only one people of God. There are not two peoples of God. And so Moses was faithful in all God's house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in other words, Jesus, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Uh, that's just a, a, a general illustration. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So uh, he's just pointing out that God is the builder of his house, and his house is the people of God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all God's house as a servant for a testimony. How did he serve? He served as a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. In other words, he spoke of Christ. And this is precisely what Jesus says in John chapter 5 when he's rebuking the Pharisees. Don't you know that Moses wrote about me? And if you fail to appreciate the continuity between the Old and New Testaments, if I can put it that way, uh, you're always going to end up breaking things up and bifurcating thing, in, things in ways that the Scripture doesn't do. You'll end up with two people of God, two ways of salvation, uh, two plans of God, two different eternities. It, it, you know, be a real mess essentially. But remember what the writer of Hebrews is saying is this absolute continuity that Moses was a serpent preparing you for the testimony of Christ and Christ confirmed that when he said, didn't you know that Moses wrote about me? And Moses uh, indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards, but Christ as the son over his own house, whose house we are. You see, we're the house. Not two different houses. I'm going to just beat up that point left and right because it's just a really silly idea out there that somehow uh, snuck into American evangelicalism that there are two people of God, Israel versus the church. That is just simply not true. There is one house of God, and Moses was preparing for that, whose house we are if, and here's the conditional statement, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope uh, firm to the end. Now we transition into more properly what we're looking at this evening. Now in verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and now he's going to quote a long section from Psalm 95, uh, verses 7 through 11. And it's a, if you look it up in your Bible, it's a direct quote. He just imports the entire uh, section of Psalm. But to get started, you have to appreciate how he introduces the psalm. He says, as the Holy Spirit says. So he is equating the scriptures, the written scriptures, with the speech of God himself. Now you understand why we 
spend so much time talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. The Holy Spirit cannot misspeak in any fashion. And it's not as if he's saying that the Holy Spirit is speaking in some sort of different way. He's simply saying the Holy Spirit says and then precisely quotes the written text. That means that what you have on your lap is the direct speech of God to you. And the problem with that is that it becomes kind of forceful in your life if that's true, isn't it? If what you have is the direct speech of God, then what would be our excuse for ignoring that? Or what would our excuse be uh, for maybe dumbing that down? Or what would our excuse be for seeing a word that we don't like in there and beginning to alter it? Uh, you wouldn't dare to do that, would you, if it was the speech of God? No, you wouldn't. Uh, and it's not merely that he identifies the written text itself with the speech of the Holy Spirit. Understand what he's doing now uh, is uh, talking to you about the Trinitarian God. Because he's just been talking, what, two verses ago about him who built the house, the Father, and about Christ. And now the Holy Spirit, you have the entire Trinity within three verses. So it's not uh, just any God that will do. The only God that we have, the only God is that created the universe, the only God that has spoken to us is the triune God of Scripture. It's the only one. And so every time we sort of begin to deviate uh, away from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now we're going to get in a world of trouble. But now what does the Holy Spirit want to say? He wants to remind what? Who we are. We're members of this house. We have been prepared for a long time, all the way from Moses forward, and now Christ rules this house, and the Holy Spirit has something to say to us, and wouldn't you think he would at least quote a gospel or something like that? He doesn't. He quotes a psalm. Uh, and uh, what you, we always say is, well, the psalms are, are, are a songbook. Uh, uh, the New Testament writers use the psalms like a theology text. Uh, if you want to understand who God is, read the psalms. And they're always quoting the Psalms. Uh, so now, in order to punctuate the point, he's going to say, therefore, as the Holy Spirit uh, says, today, and this is a direct quote now from Psalm 95, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. All right, so do you remember what that was? So we're going back to Exodus uh, uh, 16 now, Exodus 17, Numbers 14, and, and you have, uh, I think if you go back to Exodus 16, uh, you have a timeline that said that they had come out uh, of Egypt, and it had been uh, the 15th day of the second month. You can look it up and see if I'm quoting that right, but it's pretty, pretty close. So you're 45 days away. 45 days away from what? of watching frogs go across the land, of watching all the water turn to blood, uh, of watching miracle after miracle after miracle, seismic, cosmic miracles. Not the kind of little miracle where, you, you know, the ones you used to have on Sunday night, you know, you'd go down front, the guy would pray for you, and it's like, oh yeah, my back feels better. But you, you know, it, it wasn't an observable miracle. These were observable, catastrophic, climatic events that the children of Israel saw. And everybody in Egypt saw it. To the point where on the last night, the last plague, they come out of Egypt and every firstborn child, with the exception of the Israelites, dies in Egypt. Have you thought about what that looks like? And it wasn't just every firstborn child. It was every firstborn ox. <laughs> there was death virtually everywhere. People just dropped dead. And all of the uh, uh, Israel's children were saved because they did what? They put the blood on the doorpost. And God had warned Pharaoh over and over again, if you do not let my people go, judgment will come. And ten times incrementally more judgment, more judgment, more judgment, more judgment, more judgment. And now, 45 days later, now wouldn't you remember that the rest of your life? I mean, I would, I still think of the stinky 
things a couple guys did in my dorm in college. <laughs> I can still remember that vividly, <laughs> right? You can remember everything. Now you're 45 days away from seeing something truly catastrophic. And you come out and you're in the wilderness and what do they begin to do? Grumble and complain. In fact, they want to stone Moses. So that's quite a congregational meeting, <laughs> right? Hey, let's stone the pastor. <laughs> uh, they're literally grumbling and complaining. And what are they complaining about? Not enough food. We don't have anything to eat. And then we're thirsty. And so do you remember what God's provision for that was? God's provision was manna and meat at night. And now they're seeing all the manna. They get it in the morning and they have the meat at night. And of course, they did double the day before the Sabbath, right? Why? Right? Because you don't work on the Sabbath. And they're complaining about it, mad about it. And then pretty soon, just a couple weeks later, they get to Meribah, the waters of Meribah, the waters of bitterness, the waters of complaint. We're thirsty, but now we don't have enough to drink. And they're mad at Moses again. And Moses is now praying, Lord, just don't kill him. So Moses becomes the intercessor. He is the type of Christ. He be intercedes for his people. And the Lord withholds it and gives him water. He says, strike the rock. And you remember what Paul says in Corinthians, who the rock is? He tells the exact same story. He says, the rock was Jesus Christ. Now, that's not reading your Bible literally, is it? That's reading your Bible typologically. And that's exactly how the apostles write the New Testament. And if you don't read it that way, you're going you're gonna to get stuck. You'll never appreciate everything that the Lord is doing in Scripture. And the rock was Jesus Christ. Now, after all of that wilderness experience, the complaints and the sufferings, what is the warning? Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and they saw my works for 40 years. So do you remember what the judgment of God was? God says through Moses, all right, this generation is not going into the promised land. That's it, they're not going. And everyone, and so if, if you do the mapping, if, if you do the mapping in, 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 your, in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you just had them walking in circles for 40 years. 40 years. How old are you? 40 years. I mean, that is a long time. That's almost my entire lifetime. Why is that funny? 40 years. That's generation. That's, you're raising children. Right? That's, you now have children who have never seen Egypt, have only seen the wilderness, and they're walking in circles, and now the guy is 30 years old. And he's like, what's going on? The judgment of God. They will not enter my rest. And therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, why is this being written to a bunch of people we think were probably in Rome? Why? Well, it wasn't just to tell a cute story. It was to warn them that your entire life, and it's you too, your entire life is a wilderness. Do you realize that what you're here for is the testing of God until you get into the promised land? That's the whole program. Now, that doesn't sound like encouraging news, does it? <laughs> but I bet I say that and you say, well, you ain't wrong. Because <laughs> that's all I'm getting. I'm getting tested all the time. I'm getting sick. Relationships break. Uh, nothing goes the way you want it to, jobs get lost, everything, I mean, it's just broken, 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 broken all the time. And the reason that this is in your Bible is because you're in the wilderness now. And it's still warning to how are we going to approach God when we're in the wilderness? Because that generation approached God the wrong way. That's the bottom line. And so we have to be warned about today, because that, isn't that what he says, today? if you will hear his voice today. 
Now, re re remember the redemptive theme of Scripture. We start in the Garden of Eden, right? We start in the Garden of Eden, and it's plush. And everything is there. You get anything you want, just don't eat of the one tree. But everything else is yours for the taking. It's all a glorious thing, and you can have it. Nothing is withheld from you. And now, you sin against God, and you know more than God. And Adam says, I will be like God. And God evicts him from the garden. Think of the storyline of Scripture. What is the opposite of the garden? The wilderness. It's the place of the non-garden, <laughs> if I can put it that way. See the whole structure of your Bible. And then we're going to look at it in a few minutes. But now, when it's time to restore you and take you back to the garden, the new heavens and the new earth, with the exact same descriptions in Revelation as the Garden of Eden, Jesus goes into the wilderness to get you. And he's in there for 40 days and 40 nights, symbolizing one day for every year of the failure and the sin of the people of God who rejected him in the wilderness. Jesus goes into the wilderness and he reverses everything they did and he gets you and he's tempted by Satan and he comes and gets you and now he rescues you and takes you back to the garden where you were supposed to go. That's your storyline of scripture. All in a simple little nutshell. You could write it on a napkin. You could. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden uh, your hearts. Where your fathers tested and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Now think about that. They, he saw, they saw his works for 40 years. What is the fundamental problem with the people of Israel? The fundamental problem of the people of Israel is that they loved the manna. They loved the meat. They loved being led by the fire and the cloud. Uh, they loved the water when they got it, but they didn't love God. And that's the same struggle that we have in the wilderness of our lives. Uh, we love the blessing, but we don't love the God of blessing. And so if you read uh, through Exodus and Numbers, what you'll hear God saying is, and they don't know me. They don't know me. And so the question is, do you know God? Or do you just want his blessings without knowing him? You know, this is sort of like a, a, a kid who has like a, a maybe been orphaned as a child in a car accident, right? Maybe he lost all of his family. And maybe his mother's sister takes him in and raises him and makes sure that he is well fed and clothed his entire life. And then uh, she sends him to college. She pays for everything. Uh, she wants to make sure her sister's son is fully taken care of. Uh, and then he goes off to college and he graduates. Uh, and she keeps sending him cards and money and, you know, probably gave him a gas card in college. You know, I mean, all the things that you do for your kids when they're in college. And then he graduates from college and he never talks to her again. Doesn't want anything to do with her. Doesn't come home for Christmas, doesn't thank her, doesn't care. And if I said to you, what do you think of that kind of kid? You know, you wouldn't be real happy with him, would you? In fact, I'm, I'm looking at your faces. Some of you are scowling. It's like, I hope that's just a story. <laughs> it's that bad. I mean, it's awful, right? Well, it's not really a story. It's Israel. And it can be us. The Lord who protects us. The Lord who gives us everything. The Lord who provides for us in every single capacity of our lives. We don't really want to know him. We just want the stuff. And so we pray for stuff, don't we? Everything from give me a good parking place to give me a good job to give me a good wife. Generally that prayer is give me a better wife than you gave me. <laughs> it's a bad prayer. <laughs> it's just a bad prayer. <laughs> uh, we, we, we want the blessing. But you understand the blessing isn't what saves you. God saves you. And this is precisely what happened uh, to the children of Israel. They got stuck. And they got stuck because they wanted the gifts, but they didn't uh, want uh, the giver. And that's the whole problem. So what does he do in verse 11? He says, I swore by my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. And they didn't. There's no promised land. 
that don't get to go in. They all die uh, in the wilderness. They all die in the wilderness. So how are you going to handle your wilderness before you cross Jordan into the Promised Land? How are you going to handle it? The way to handle it is to know God. To crave knowing God. Have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can do that is through your scriptures. The Holy Spirit has spoken. The Holy Spirit says. And what He says, He says in the written text. And so, uh, this might sound a little too sa supernatural for you, but you understand the most supernatural experience that you can have on this earth right now, day in and day out, is sit down and read your Bible. And if you don't see it that way, you're not quite getting it yet. This, these are the words of life. And do you remember what Jesus said to Satan? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So this is our life. This is the source of our life. This is why I'm so uh, picky about every verse and how they all hold together and the entire sweep of redemptive history. It's why I won't leave any of the verses out. It's why I won't ignore any of them. Because I'd be afraid that I'd be ignoring the speech of God himself. And he would be saying something to us that we wouldn't hear because we skipped over it or we didn't like how it sounded or it didn't fit into our philosophical scheme or we didn't think it was logical as if God is not more logical than us. That's an immense danger uh, of being in the wilderness. So I'm gonna, I've kind of written down here, I hope I can read them, two or three lessons uh, before we get to the end of the chapter. Uh, the first lesson is simply this. The good beginnings are no guarantee. Right? It's no guarantee. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but you understand the, I, I, why I, I don't really like the phrase eternal security that much. You know, the once saved, always saved. I sort of, I let it go because I don't want to get too pushy with you. But the doctrine properly stated is the perseverance of the saints. We persevere through trouble and trial as we are united to Christ. And it's not one and done. And so, you know, often, uh, the way I grew up, we grew up in, I grew up in the revivalist school, right? So the way that you became a Christian was, you know, you had big revival meetings. My dad would have tent meetings. And, and literally, people would come to the tent meeting, there'd be a lot of musicians, and, you know, it would be like mini Billy Graham kind of stuff. You know, but in Millinocket. <laughs> not, not as cool, I guess, but that's where he would do it. Uh, and people would come, and, and you, you know, sit on benches, folding chairs, and he'd have an altar call. And people would get saved. The Lord would save people. The Lord would use that. And people would be very emotional. Very emotional. Cry, weep before the Lord. And that's good, repentance. I don't mind people crying in repentance. That's great. Uh, but then, you know, they'd come to church, and six months later, things have kind of died down a little bit. And the conversation would always be, I need to get back to that moment when I got saved. And I'm sorry, that is not good for you. Identifying the beginning as a deeply emotional moment or something like that is always going to get you into trouble down the road. Because a good beginning is not a guarantee of a good end. And so you're going to have to have something more than a high-charged feeling. You're going to have to have the speech of God. And you're going to have to have it day in and day out. And you're going to have to eat of it for breakfast and eat of it for lunch and eat of it for dinner. And of course, just like us, we don't remember what we had last Thursday to eat, do we? But most of us look pretty healthy as I look around and we look pretty good. <laughs> We have no idea what we ate. Well, that's what the Bible's like. You just keep reading it and reading it and reading it and drinking in the Word of God and understanding the Lord. And in doing that, you end up well-fed and you end up strong, even though you might not remember an individual uh, meal. So a good beginning uh, uh, doesn't guarantee an end. Uh, the other thing uh, this kind of teaches us is this, that a hard heart will wreck your life. 
The, the problem with the Israelites is that they, they had a hard heart. They, didn't, they were resistant to the Lord. Uh, they were uh, always rebelling against the Lord and rebelling against the, who the Lord brought to minister to them, Moses and Joshua. All of them in complete rebellion. And a hard heart will kill you. What you need is a tender heart. Why? Because a tender heart, the Word of God can penetrate that. And what was the prime example? Why is he drawing you back? Who had the hardest heart of all? Pharaoh, right? His heart was hard. You could see frogs everywhere? Not listening. You could have blood in the rivers? Not listening. Grasshoppers? No. Everybody dead? No. Think about this. Ten unbelievable judgments against Pharaoh. His hard heart. Surely, after every firstborn child in Egypt was dead that night, wouldn't you say, no mas? You know, enough is enough? No, no, no. He chases them into the wilderness. Mount up, we're going. That's a hard heart. And that's what you have to to protect yourself from. You have to have an open and tender heart to the Lord all the time. Listen to his speech. Even when it's tough to take, listen to his speech. Even when you don't want to do it, listen to his speech. Even if it doesn't feel good, listen to his speech. Listen to his speech. And then the final uh, lesson I think that would be good for us to remember is, and, and I know that you don't hear this much or haven't heard it much, but God's wrath is absolutely real. Absolutely real. Uh, we don't talk about it anymore because we've become such a sentimental church in America. And you forget that what you're saved from is the wrath to come. Uh, and without the protection of Christ, without Christ taking all the wrath of a holy God on the cross of Calvary, then you are completely unprotected against the wrath of God without Jesus Christ. He is the only covering for that. Uh, and so uh, we read passages like this in Hebrews, uh, and they're not popular passages. No one's, you know, memorizing these. No one's sticking them on their refrigerator. Uh, they don't feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, but you have to understand that the wrath of God is completely real, and it's completely correct. It is the correct response of a holy and moral God to sin. It is the correct response. It's what he should do. If he did not respond this way to sin, he wouldn't be holy and he wouldn't be moral. Uh, moral people hate immorality. Moral people hate sin. Uh, you uh, need to learn to hate what God hates. Uh, it, it, it is not our job to smudge black and white into indefinite gray. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Sin is sin, and holiness is holiness. Don't get confused about that. We were warned about it, and they called the good evil, and they called the evil good. And if you're confused about those basic categories, you're in danger of the wrath of God. It's, it's really that simple. So the next thing he says uh, in verse 12, I think I've set it up for the word, beware. Watch out. Be careful. Uh, pay attention, brethren, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. Lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief. And so, I think what we have to do is uh, every day put on the gospel stethoscope and listen to our own hearts. You know those uh, apps you can buy now? They send them to you and you put your fingers on them uh, and, and, and then your heart rate will come up on the phone and, and I think you can even send that to your doctor. We ought to have one of those for an evil heart. How's my heart doing this morning? Ew, not so good. <laughs> Uh, so good, I need to preach the gospel to myself today. <laughs> I, I, I need to, you know, throw myself on the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. 
Uh, I need to repent and believe the gospel. You know, repent and believe the gospel is not something that you do at the beginning of your Christian life. Repent and believe the gospel is every single moment of your life. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. This is what Jesus says. Repent and believe the gospel. And the problem is what? Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. What generates all evil is unbelief. You do not actually believe God. And when you stop believing God and what God has spoken, there is no choice but evil. That's what's coming next. That's, that's next in line. And so all the root of all of our problems and all of our struggle with sin is at the end of the day, we in those moments do not believe what God has said. We do not believe the God who created us. And that is something we need to be aware of. So being uh, in you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. You see, that's the issue. It's always, it's always you're moving away from the living God. Instead, what are we supposed to do? To exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened, again hardening, through the deceitfulness of sin. So here you have a two-step program for how to take care of this. Step one is what? Beware. In other words, be completely aware of what's going on. Pay attention. Pay attention to your spiritual life. Pay attention to your relationship with the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, it's amazing. How uh, long does it take you to think of Jesus throughout your day? Well, I was busy until like nine. How long does it take? So the very first step is to be aware, to be totally plugged in. But the second step is one that we actually, you know, don't believe either because it says to do what? Exhort one another daily. Exhort, who's the one another? It's other Christians. It's not cousin Bob the pagan. Right? It's, it, it's other Christians. Well, I have another name for that that's called the church. Can uh, I ask you how it would be possible for you to exhort one another daily if you are not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ? I don't think you can do it. I don't think so. It's what we discussed this morning in Romans, isn't it? Lone Ranger Christianity isn't Christian. Uh, and the method, the practical method that the Lord has to keep you on the straight and narrow, if I can put it that way, is other believers challenging us, talking to us, helping us be accountable. So if you see another believer in Christ and you actually love them and they're going to step off a cliff, wouldn't you want to say something about that to them? Sure you would. And of course, you say it graciously and in love. But you say it. You dare not not say it. You must say it. Because this is precisely what the Lord uses. This is the system. So that's, in a practical way, you now understand why I'm always beating the drum of become a member of the church. Get in a fellowship group. Know each other's names. Stop being so isolated. Don't be a lone ranger. Get to know people. I don't like them. That's ah, alright, they don't like you either. It'll work out. <laughs> You'll figure it out. It'll be okay. You know, love your enemies. <laughs> you can do this. Because that is how the Lord has structured the system to work. So, but exhort one another while it is called today, and I have to kind of go quickly here, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. In other words, that's what softens you. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, and now he again quotes Psalm 95, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. And then his final uh, little piece, For who, having heard, rebelled? Who did that? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? People always ask the question, did those people 
get saved? And the answer is no. Because the Lord took an oath that they would not go into the promised land. He did not elect them. He did not save them. Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he, meaning the Lord, angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom, and here it is, he did swear that they would not enter his rest. And remember what it means to enter the rest of the Lord. You enter his rest, that is salvation. That is salvation. And you'll see that. He's going to develop that theme. But to those who did not obey, see, so, now, there, now that you know that, now he's back to warning the church of Jesus Christ. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. And that is what we need to be aware of. How much do you really believe the Lord? How much do you really believe him? How much do you really believe the Ten Commandments? I always start with the Ten Commandments because I can't usually get past one or two and we're struggling. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you believe that? Uh, do you believe that if you put any other gods before the Lord of the universe that bad things will happen? Do you really believe that? Do you honor your mother and father? Do you believe that? Do you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Do you believe that? Thou shalt not lie. Do you believe that? Murder. Do you believe that? Adultery. Think of all the sexuality we're dripping in. People just stop believing it. We have whole churches that have given a pass to that. Sorry. No passes. Sin is sin is sin is sin. Covenant. For crying out loud, we, we, we have a whole cottage industry. We've built an entire country of commerce around coveting. Every advertisement is teaching you to covet, is tutoring you to sin, every single one. Do you believe God, or do you believe the advertisement? And I could spend the next two hours here going through verse after verse and say, do you really believe that, or do you believe your culture? Do you really believe God, or do you believe something you've been told? Do you really believe the scriptures, or not? And here's what he warns us of. Remember, see, uh, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I want you to go into the new heavens and the new earth. But you can't go there without full belief in the righteousness of Christ alone for your salvation. Believe Christ and obey the gospel and enjoy getting out of the wilderness and back to the plush new heavens and the new earth. Trust what God has said and trust nothing else. Nothing else. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight uh, that you have given us your word. It's a stark word. It's a word of mourning. Uh, and we have to remember uh, that that is one of the ways that you train us in righteousness, to warn us against sin, uh, to warn us against unbelief. And I pray tonight, Lord, that none of us will have hardened hearts. I pray, Lord, that we will not be uh, uh, deceived by sin. I pray, Lord, that we will believe you in everything that you have said in these last days of your Son. We pray these things for his sake. Amen.